th this is my entire point with Uber is that they, their executive team and their culture is trying to solve for a problem where their primary competitor is going to literally shit millions of self-driving units per year while they try to aggregate 50,000 of them. That's 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 the issue with Uber. They just will not have the scale to compete at, at the price, right? I, I don't think Uber is dead simply because network effects are really hard to establish and they've got those network effects. But I do see the argument that if Tesla, in a flip of a switch, even if it's five years from now instead of five months from now, can have hundreds of thousands of vehicles inside of the robo-taxi network autonomously that are turned on, which is the supply side of, of the network that is so hard to build. Like, like, like Netflix is winning because they built their own content, right? They have that supply side, and that's why it's hard for Hulu and HBO to keep, uh, to keep up. They have to keep licensing other people's content. That's what makes Netflix special and, more importantly, profitable. I think if Tesla can do that, if we're entering into a self-driving autonomous world where that is the de facto way people travel, distribution's not going to be hard because Elon has a lot of followers and attention, and it's Tesla. It's a worldwide brand. And if the cost per mile goes down... I do think that's easily replicatable. Now, I don't think that kills Uber because Uber is going to partner with a lot of other companies that are in this self-driving space. But the question is, if those self-driving experiences like a Waymo is not the type of experience like a Tesla, it doesn't kill them. It just means their market share is not going to grow as dramatically as some of the Uber bulls think it's going to grow. So I don't think they're dead, but I, I also don't think they're going to. But what does that do to their valuation if they go from being a growing company to a shrinking company? That's a good point. I mean, but here's the thing. Like, like companies getting like, delisted off the stock market or bankrupt like that's just really hard to do when you have a brand as powerful as i mean this app has been number two or number one on the app store in at least the united states for the past five years like it's airbnb and uber and i think it's like united airlines and a couple other like th this is it, it's a brand that is so universally known and there's not gonna be tesla fsd in india not anytime soon right so i'm like maybe eventually but not anytime so uber is a i was just in india to eight months ago uber is a big player so that's what i mean by it's not going to be dead but valuation wise when we talk about exponential growth yeah, I mean, I'd rather own Tesla stock. So here, let me uh, make the tangential case for Uber's path to not only survive, but thrive. And I don't know that they're going to do this or not. But, you know, I've been thinking a lot about competition for these markets that RoboTaxi is moving into. And everyone, you know, we, we think about, hey, like Tesla RoboTaxi is going to be way more competitive than Ubers with human drivers or Uber, like, you know, it's cheaper to drive a cyber cab to someone's house with an Optimus in it and have the Optimus robot, you know, go take the in and out burger up to someone's door and drop it off and leave than it is for Uber. But <clears throat> we're just in this era of massive disruption and technological disruption. And I think companies like Zipline, for example, like that's a way better technological first principle solution to deliver in and out burgers to someone's house than and for those a cyber cab and an optimus with zip so what is exactly zipline like what what is their offering zipline is the amazon drone delivery company that jeff bezos promised us and failed to deliver and it's real they have been delivering packages for decade like a decade now roughly um have done millions of deliveries, um, millions and millions of miles traveled, zero human safety incidents. They went and set up in the country of Rwanda to do delivery of health supplies to hospitals kind of as their first use case uh, a number of years ago. And so they would do, uh, I think it primarily started with just blood. So they would transport blood from the main um, capital city out to all these remote hospitals and stuff. And because Rwanda invited them in, you know, they worked with them on all the aviation um, rules and regulations and helped facilitate all of this. They worked, you know, on a very hard and important problem. And so they were able to like fully uh, <clears throat> debug their process, their, you know, de risk the technology itself, get everything really ramped up they had a you know a good customer base they've been ramping up with revenue like you know they have been operating this business now um and it's a legitimate business and so they've got the the technology is down it works it's great the high level concept is you've got this drone that it is a quadcopter drone mixed with a normal you know what you would think of an airplane would look like where you've got wings and a tail and you know a propeller in the back that pushes 
but then they so they have that with then four rotors kind of two in front of the wings two behind the wings that face upward so that it can take off and land vertically but then it can fly very efficiently forward and <clears throat> what it does so that allows it to use a lot less energy to go long distances with your with your payload and so they can go to the in and out burger they have a pod underneath it that is on a winch that goes up and down and so they can fly right up to the in and out burger the in and out burger has this little window they drop the pod into the window the in and out burger puts your food in the pod then it retracts that back up into the drone the drone flies over your house and it stays like 200 feet in the air so you don't see it you don't hear it and then this pod just lowers they can hit a dinner plate on your lawn as far as accuracy and they can drop off they could like you could literally set your plate outside on your patio and zipline can drop your burger on your plate and then fly off and go do the next thing <clears throat> and so like you just think about this from a first principle standpoint this drone weighs 20 pounds it's transporting your five pound meal and it's flying directly to you. It's not having to go through traffic. It's not having to wait at red lights. So like your food is going to get to you way faster because they're traveling in a direct line to you. And it's going to, so it's going to be hotter, fresher, all of that stuff. And then the energy that they're consuming to transport your food to you is a lot less because the thing that's doing the transporting weighs 20 pounds instead of 3000 pounds. Um, so anyways, like that's, these are the types of competitive threats to use cases that are going to, a lot of people are going to use to justify like cyber cab can do anything and everything. Like we're just going to think, Hey, cyber cabs are the end all be all solution to all human transportation of stuff problems. And in my, um, I think that there is going to be other stuff that's like this, that, if Uber wants to buy a company like Zipline and then go buy up Joby and Archer and all these other companies that, you know, get into the human VTOL ride sharing space, which is kind of an easier application to solve um, the autonomy. And the hard thing is actually getting VTOLs that are safe with humans at scale. And this is what Travis always wanted to do, but these kind of, orthogonal sources of competition to Tesla RoboTaxi. Like there is a possibility for a company like Uber to then, you know, bring their distribution network and be fast adopters of these technologies of non non ground transportation. Yes. But they have to go down that direction. They yep. have to pull the lever to do that. Is there any, is there any, are there any clues or any decisions by the executive team that are, that are pointing them towards that direction of moving away from ground transportation and adopting things like drones, as an example? Is there anything out there that Uber's saying we're going to do that? I don't think so. And that's, that's my entire point. Is that, unless, I mean, this is what got Travis run out of the company, isn't it? That he wanted to keep he wanted investing to, money and this kind of stuff. And, uh, he got ran out of the company. This is my point. Th this is my entire point with Uber is that they, their executive team and their culture is trying to solve for a problem where their primary competitor is going to literally shit millions of self-driving units per year while they try to aggregate 50,000 of them. That's, that's, that's the issue with Uber. They just will not have the scale to compete at, at the price, right? So, I mean, we'll see. And, and again, so like, and then the justification becomes, okay, in markets where you have uh, human labor for, for driving, that is very, very low. Like say your Indias and your Chinas, et cetera, et cetera. Does Uber, can Uber work in those countries? Oh, of course it can. But you're telling me that that valuation for that company is going to be vastly different than the valuation for uh, like a Tesla. And then in addition to that, once that self-driving company that is producing millions of units per year goes in that market with their app, because why on earth would they ever give up their product and their pricing power to somebody else? What happens to Uber then? Do you think you're wrong at all that Elon and Uber won't, won't partner in some way? 
I just don't understand why Elon would want to give up control of the Tesla network in any way, shape, or form when he has openly said multiple times that if you want to operate a robo taxi, it has to be done on the Tesla network. And if you and if you think about it from a pricing power perspective, why why are you allowing somebody else to dictate the price of the car to the end user? And then in the yeah. case of an Uber, for Uber to work, like or own I'm, the customer experience, or own the customer experience exactly. And when you're talking about Tesla, like like Elon, I think from a cultural perspective, like like how he sets the tone of the company, if it's important, they do it. And there's nothing more important with Tesla than customer experience because that's what sells the product. That's yeah. why they don't advertise. It's because of us. Because Hans and I, two lunatics are out there talking about how great this company is on our own volition because of how incredible the product is. Why on earth would you ever give that up? It's a good point. Look, I, that's why that's I, I agree from a stock picker's perspective, there's no way in hell I'd buy Uber over Tesla. It's just like, it's obvious to me. The timeline on flipping on that RoboTaxi network could take some time in which Uber still captures their market share, puts up their free cash flow, all that stuff. But the inevitability, and I think we're seeing this right now with Apple, dude. Like one of my good friends, Steve, who comes on my channel a lot, last night he finally said, admit, because I've been giving him shit about Apple for years. He's like, you're right. He saw the liquid glass stuff at WWDC. He was like, you know what? Vision Pro didn't work. Siri's a mess. They have no AI mode. Like I can't. How what could I find What's going on over there? Yeah. <laughs> how could you buy Apple over in uh, NVIDIA? And so when it comes to Uber Tesla, if Uber does not have the type of supply that Tesla has or the AI that Tesla has, like it really is tough to bet on good free cash flow in 2025 versus the future in 2035. 100%. Like Uber is limited by by drivers. And 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 self-driving companies that are willing to manufacture self-driving cars to put on Uber's network. That 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 is their supply. And yeah. the only way to increase the supply of of self-driving cars is by forcing them to make as many as Tesla. That doesn't seem like mm -hmm. an attainable thing because once that company can make enough can, can can match up with Tesla. They just come up with their own app because then they can create their own their own thing. You know, they can create their own economies of scale with that. So anyway, I don't want to rehash the points we've been talking about on the stream. So um, I, I was just think curious one other thing is curious on Uber's strategy. Like, why are they not investing in contracting with comma AI? Like that makes no sense to me. I agree. Like. Why are you trying to work with Waymo, like all these other companies, but you're not working with Comma? That makes no sense to me. And it like that tells me that their their taste in what technology solution is ultimately going to dominate this market is absolute shit. Like their technical judgment is dog shit. Yeah. I, I, but but I, I don't know. People don't see it. I think a lot of people are still sort of on this thing. It's like, hey, you know, stock is what near all time highs or all time well, well, highs but, or something. But when it was at sixty, this is when Bill Ackman bought thirty million shares. Like, it, it, like he, from his perspective, it was undervalued, which it was, and now it's at like ninety. But in five years, with all the stuff going around with Tesla, if they figure this part out, I wonder how an Ackman thinks of it because he's not a dumb guy. He just, you know, he can't buy Tesla because the multiples are too aggressive, but. I wonder if he sees where the future is going and, where, and and if he should at least hold on to the stake in Uber that he still has. What do you think is the best value stock on the market right now? Like, And that's that's not being talked about enough. You can't say Palantir. Yeah, it's, 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 I talk about and why is it NVIDIA? <laughs> Dude, my conviction on NVIDIA is getting deeper and deeper. I mean, like this why? is... I mean, well, I, it's, it, the, the, the statistics I'm seeing in regards to the use of LLMs uh, one came out yesterday, ChatGPT has a 90% retention rate, so 9 out of 10 people every month that they sign up, they come back. The only other product in history that it has anything close to a 90% retention rate is YouTube with 85%. So whether, whether you love ChatGPT or not, the point is Grok, Anthropic, all these LLMs are taking away the attention we had on traditional products and services, and they're bringing us into the AI supercomputer world that we're in, and it's the worst it's ever going to be. And so NVIDIA is the backbone of all of that. And, you know, we can talk about humanoids, all that stuff. But like th this is going to be the it's not a cyclical AI story. Oracle just said they're going to grow 100 percent on the remaining performance obligations uh, next year. 40 percent cloud computing growth, 70 percent uh, enterprise uh, database suite growth. Like it is going to be insanity. The like the types of growth we're going to see across the entire sector. And all of that comes down to hyperscalers, models, GPUs to support all that. So I, I think NVIDIA is like one of my biggest convictions right now. Um, 
And so that's why I'm bullish. In terms of value stocks, too, I, I don't know. Like a stock that's not being talked about enough that, that is uh, special. I mean, there's one that I like a lot called Grab, but we can get into that. But UNH, I think, is cheap, even though it fell 50%. But like in terms of technology stocks that have no hype that are going to be really special, I think the entire world is focused so deeply on these AI names and hyper analyzing them every day that it's hard to find a real undervalued one right now. What does Grab do? Sorry, Hans, go. Go. Uh, no, let's do Grab first, and then we'll come back to this. Yeah. So ironically, Grab is the Uber of Southeast Asia. Um, and <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for re reconfirming my thesis. Go for it. <laughs> yeah, I mean, look, it, it's more so a bet on the nature of the company. It's a $20 billion company. They have $9 billion in cash. Uh, in Southeast Asia, Vietnam, Thailand, Philippines, you don't have any FSD coming soon. Now, eventually that will be there. And they've, they've already done partnerships with AV companies, et cetera. I don't know if Tesla is going to take over that market until they take over the Northeast market or the European market. I mean, like Southeast Asia, the problem is Tesla's not going to make a lot of money in Southeast Asia. Like the disposable income there is not that dramatic. And so you kind of need, and Uber tried to beat Grab in Southeast Asia in 2018 and they lost like big Big, you know, $200 billion company Uber had to leave the region and take an equity stake in the company because they weren't able to assimilate to the cultural values, all that type of stuff. This is ticker symbol Grab, G-R-A-B. Yeah. 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 Mobility, uh, financial services, they have a ton of banking products, and then they're a deliveries app. They, they're a super app. So, you know, WeChat in China, that's what they are for Southeast Asia. And I've fallen in love with the financials. I love the founder. The stock's been stuck at four bucks for five years. At some point, I think it breaks out. They just raised a billion and, and 1.5 billion bucks. I think they're going to use that money to acquire other companies, increase their margins, all that stuff. So to me, it's more of a financial value play. It's not like this big, darling AI tech company. Uh, and I think the downside is limited. So it's kind of safe in my portfolio because I have so much risk with NVIDIA, Pounder, and Hood, et cetera. Um, but yeah, I mean, look, FSD is a threat to them. I just think that threat is a bit farther away until it actually scales in North America and Europe and then eventually can go across the world. Yeah, I. so it's kind of like the... So it's it's literally the Uber of second and third tier economic countries. Yeah, and yeah. and 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 because those countries don't have a big population that's becoming digitally native, like it's growing, but it's not as sophisticated. I mean, these guys are just trying to figure out what it means to incorporate into a digital economy. And so the Grab has like 90% ratings in terms of their brand presence. Like they've become a virtual monopoly in the region. And so they're not priced like it. It was a $20 billion company with $10 billion in cash. So to me, it's like wow. it's kind of obvious that in a couple of years, this thing gets at least 40, 50 billion. And they're, and they're making a profit? Yeah, they just turned profitable three quarters. So they weren't profitable for the past couple of years. And they just turned profitable three quarters ago. A net adjusted EBITDA profitable, uh, gap profitable, free cash flow is at like 800 million. Like all the metrics I care about as like a value investor are inflecting up into the right. Howard Marks, legendary investor, just bought 10 million shares. So I have a lot of options on them. And if the if, if this thing hits ten dollars, I will make seven hundred percent on my money in two years. Wow. Now, granted, it's gotta hit ten bucks, you know, so that's that's the gamble here. But yeah. That's, that's very interesting.